next speaker is going to be uh, Colonel Kevin Cheney. We've, we've been waiting. He's been set up by everybody in front of him uh, about, you know, what he's going to bring. So all the answers are about to be told. Uh, but he is the project manager for aircraft survivability equipment, uh, and his team is actually the group that followed through with all the detailed planning on behalf of uh, General Volmeck. Uh, you know, a lot of folks, uh, they spend great deals of money to bring here to make sure that they get the latest and greatest and go back and put it in the unit. So, Kevin, we could not have done it without you. Uh, you permitted them to be here. So, once again, the podium's yours. Thank you. So, Rod Turner and Steve O'Brien, they handled the infrared countermeasures counter piece, which you see the systems below there. You've got uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Hill and Lee Tootin are handling missile warning. Uh, Bill Cottle and Jamie Kimball are handling threat detection. That's our RF capabilities. And our newest office that just got stood up is uh, being manned by Lieutenant Colonel JT Naylor and Jason Matheny, and that's CSI, our Common Systems Integration. Uh, you see what they do down there. They're really handling the JUONSs, the ONSs, uh, FMS, ABE capability, and the integration of our systems on the platform, which is a key aspect of what we do. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk to you today about two things. One is the AC culture. We're trying to shift the culture and change that a little bit. Um, and the second piece is the IRAD, where I think industry should be investing their dollars to make AAC relevant for the future. So the first item is AAC culture. We, General Volmack hit on it since, 2000, since the NDA language in 2016, uh, 17 and 18. Congress and OSD has given us a lot of rapid acquisition authorities. We're trying to leverage those as best as possible. That doesn't mean we're running out there and just using MTA for everything. Uh, like General Fomex said, we've got to use it for the right time, for the right program. There's other things besides military acquisition authorities, and we're trying to pair those up with all the right programs and efforts, giving them the path that they're going on. Uh, but a key focus area for us is really getting the technology out to the users, out to the field as fast as possible, which means that we're gonna to have to do that in smaller increments. So for the loggies in here, I'm gonna tell you right now, the days of pure fleet are probably gone. We're gonna have multiple configurations that we're gonna to have to manage out in the fleet, but that's done purposefully so that we can get the best technology out there in the fight so that we ultimately are protecting our soldiers and they're allowed to complete their mission. Uh, the third bullet there has been hit on a lot, swap C, uh, open architecture, multi-spectral, multi-function. I'm just going to foot stomp on this and say as we go forward and you look in a few slides on where I think industry should be investing their IRAD, if you're not focused on these and you're not having dual purpose usage, you're probably not going to be a solution set that we're going to pursue more importantly, you're not going to get on the aircraft. So start thinking those things through of how is my technology going to be beneficial not only in one area, but can it accomplish another mission in another area. Uh, we're working with the Intel community uh, to try to partner in our s and partners and guide where we think uh, future technologies need to go. Plant those seeds early, plant them often. Uh, not of all of them sprout to technology that actually makes it out there into the fleet, but that's okay. We always learn from the failures too. But if we're not doing anything, if we're not leaning forward, then we're failing at our mission. So we're working heavily with Ralph Trezio and his teams at I2 to try to figure out where we need to go in the future. Um, both Colonel Coyle and General Volmack hit on this, the A and B kit optimization. Uh, one of the things that we got to look at is there's an A kit that goes on the platform that stays on there permanently, and then the B kit's the technology we bring in there, usually the sensors packet. Uh, right now, the B kit, almost every one of those has its own dedicated processor, processor and we've got to get away from that. There's advancements in computing and stuff like that, microelectronics, where we got to be able to host those processors in a common server at some point in time and pare down that weight on the aircraft. 
For A-kit optimization, we're going to start looking at adding fiber capability on the aircraft to reduce the weight as long as it doesn't degrade the performance of the system. But at the end of the day, swap, allowing our uh, customers to have a higher performing aircraft is really what we're going after. And to answer your question, Chris, from my perspective, what we're doing for FVL is we're, we're looking at legacy, or the legacy fleet. We're trying to put the best technology we can on there, and that will inform of, of us of the issues as we go forward for FBL of how we can do it better. And then the last thing we're looking at is tier detect and defeat capability as we go forward. And I'll get more on that in the IRAD piece. Uh, obviously, the goal is, is to stay ahead of the threat and provide overmatch so that our our soldiers can complete their mission and be effective and so we can complete overall operations as we go forward. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Colonel Coyle kind of hit uh, on the threat qu uh, quite a bit. Um, it's a multifaceted environment that we're operating in. It's an RF environment. They're being protected by IR man pads. Uh, so it's a very complex. You can't for 15 years, we've focused on the IR man pads, and we've gotten to be pretty effective at that. Not saying that we're going to stop, because there's new technology that's continuing to come. But uh, the area that we need to focus more on is the RF piece. Uh, across the top, what you see is the legacy. It's kind of proliferated from analog, hot metal trackers that had no counter countermeasure capability to where we're kind of at right now, which is pseudo imagers digital reprogramming capability of those threats, which is pretty scary, um, with advanced counter counter major technologies. And then in the future is really scary with the imagers, the AES arrays, and multi-spectral aspects of how the threat's going. Um, next slide, please. So for those of us in this room that deal with ASC on a Daily basis, this is a fairly simplistic chart. Uh, there's parts of the spectrum or threats on the left-hand side, and obviously we got to be able to see what's coming at the aircraft. So we have different sensors in different parts of the spectrum to uh, see what's coming at us. Then we got to analyze that data, and then we got to trigger the appropriate response or the defeat mechanism, albeit flares, chaff, uh, laser-based jammer, or some combination thereof of all of those. What I've challenged my team with is what we need to start thinking about is that little blue box down there in the middle. How do we come up with a technology that allows us to see everything that's coming at the aircraft and defeat everything that's coming at the aircraft? Now that's, as my engineers always tell me, you, you draw up these concepts and they they're seem real easy and they brief well and the leadership loves them, but that's extremely hard to do right there. Uh, I see a lot of the engineers in their crowd going, yes. Uh, but the other piece of that is, is like I touched upon earlier, we've got to get out of the mindset of having a black box tied to sensors, processing information, and sharing it with the rest of the, uh, with the pilot and, and triggering a response. At the end of the day, ASC in the future should look like this. It should be sensors or defeat mechanisms with cards, capabilities that's hosted somewhere else on the platform. That's the only way we're going to reduce the swap and get to data fusion in the future. Next slide, please. So this is our current capabilities, what we have out here. Uh, on, the far, on the top row, you've got your detect systems. On the bottom row, you've got your defeat systems. Um, CMOS has done a great job so far. We've updated it with the Juliet D to address the SOCOM Juons. Uh, there were some concerns. Right now we're working on a kilo drop. Some of those people have heard that the kilo drop hasn't gone as well as planned. What it turns out is, is actually kilo is just as effective as Juliet D and it adds more threats to the capability than it was previously. So it was a testing issue that we had. We worked through with the testers. So I'm here to say Juliet D, or Kilo, is as effective as Juliet D as we go forward. Uh, General Volmec hit it on it quite a bit on LIMWAS. There's a lot of capabilities in there that's going to allow us to start leveraging and going forward in the future. 
One of the things that you don't see up there, which should be the next logical box, is ATDS, or the threat, Advanced Threat Detection System. The Army's taking a strategic pause right now. We're reassessing, obviously, due to the success of the Juan's piece with CMOS's capability, with what you see down in the bottom, which is the Advanced Threat Detection Large Aircraft ATW Online Aircraft System. That system's out there in the fight right now, flying around, doing a great job. And then the missile warning system of, that's next going out into the fight is LIMWAS. But strategically, we're going to take a pause and we're going to look forward and see if this is the right, where do we need to go for FVL? And we want to make sure we're, jump, we're going for leap ahead technology for FVL that kind of satisfies those factors or requirements that I set out previously. Um, so we're going to do a lot of market research and, and go around and try to look at different technology and see where we need to go in the future. So ATDS is going to be paused for now. We're going to continue to push out current capability and address the threat and see where we need to go from there. Um, Colonel Coyle and General Volmack hit on RWR. To me, that's really one of the priorities of my portfolio. As we go into the fight that Colonel Coyle showed you on there with the combined RFIR uh, capabilities out there on the battlefield, this is the piece that scares me because we've kind of taken strategic risk here over the years. DV2, as General Volmack said, is going to provide some capabilities out there, but really where we need to get to is MRWR. And that's going to give you a higher range of frequency and a lower range of frequency that we can go after to track the threats. And it gives you a full digital capability that we're going to need as we go forward. And then right now, our laser detection system is about this, as state of art as you can get. But we need to be looking forward out there because the threat is continuing to progress. Uh, the defeat bot piece on the bottom, ATERCOM has been out there for a while. I will tell you it's still an effective system. So those that fly the 47, you are still protected. It's doing a great job out there. It's effective against the SOCOM JUONS threat. Um, and we're trying to get to the far right, which is Kirkham. But what you have wedged there in the middle, I talked about it briefly, that's our JUON solution that's out there in the, flight, or in the fight right now. Um, and as soon as we can, we'd like to, and we get a requirement approved from the headquarters, we'd like to shift that and try to focus more on the Kirkham aspect. Kirkham's done a great job through its testing. Now my challenge is, is and Rod Turner's challenge is get this out to the fight as fast as possible. Uh, the 47s are protected right now with laser-based jammers for a Turkham, but we got to get the Apaches and the Blackhawks covered with Kirkham. And I think the last chart I have here is where I think industry should be investing their technology. Next chart, please. Yes. So as we go forward, this is, I think, technology-wise of the areas that need to be focused in on that will help us posture ourselves and prepare ourselves for the future. Um, General Volmec kind of hit it, multi-band RI sensors or active sensors. We got to look at how do we go from passive systems to active systems or some combination thereof in the future. AI, cognitive learning, machine learning, we're doing a little bit of that at LIMWAS, but we need to do much more of that with all of our systems. At the end of the day, Colonel Coyle hit on a little bit. We've got to get out of the exploitation of threats. We got to just be able to say, there's a new threat out there. It's coming at me. Here's the appropriate defeat mechanism. Go hit it and knock it out of the sky. Um, one of the things that we're good at right now, dropping down a bullet, is we understand single ship on threat and how we do. We don't understand how effective we are in formation flights, manned and unmanned teaming. So we're going to start doing some studies and looking at that and probably doing some digital simulation and see how we do against that. Because ideally, if you can, if you can have multiple threats coming at you, but you have multiple capabilities, and you can figure out what's the best solution set for that between the different aircrafts, you're going to be far more effective. And that's how we need to start thinking in the future, which obviously means that we need to have situational awareness of what's going around us and where our partners are. Uh, domestic sources of supply, um, 
this is twofold for me. This is the insider threat, making sure we protect against the insider threat that's out there. And then two, I know there's challenges in the microelectronics arena, and we need to push hard in that area to continue to work and condense down that technology so it can get on cards and boards and be hosted elsewhere. I've talked about the A kit and B kit optimization. On the defeat side, the first two kind of go together. We need to come up with that technology, be it laser, be it something else, that's going to help to degrade that threat or ultimately we want to shoot it out of the sky. I know that sounds like Star Wars kind of thing, but that's kind of how we need to start thinking of these things and that's the only way we're going to actually be able to get there at some point. I talked about the RF piece. We're working on the detect. What you didn't see on there was any RFCM, RF countermeasures piece. That is a huge hole in the portfolio right now. I'm having to leverage the uh, PEO ammo with their chafe development of what they're doing to kind of protect us right now. But that's an area that we need to go after in the future and provide the jamming capability so that we can be effective and protect ourselves. And then the last three there on the, uh, on the defeat side are all kind of go together. Uh, we need to do smart dispensing of the threats, be it flares, chafe, laser-based jammer, some combination of those. We need to be able to adapt to whatever the threat is, and then we need to, we need to smartly use all our inventory. But the banner, banner at the bottom, I just want to foot stop in one more time. If you're not thinking of that, you're not going to get on the platform. At the end of the day, it's all about getting technology that has dual purpose, multi-spectral usage, that considers swap, and it allows us to readily adapt and pull in new technology and provide it out to the warfighter quickly. With that, I'm done with my comments, and I will open it up for questions and grab a drink of water. Let, let me ask you one question. Um, you know, you're talking about multiple use, how you integrate and do the rest. But, you know, what we have a tendency to do is we look at the next emerging threat as it comes out, and then we, we react to that. How do we get into a classified environment more often with industry to get industry out in front of that threat so we're not doing the, you know, okay, they did something, now we'll react, and then they'll do something different. <laughs> Great question, sir. Um, we've had a classified session earlier this week, which we invited industry to participate in, and I think I've gotten some feedback from that. It was a very effective session. They're uh, definitely more cued in on where the threat is right now, and I think we need to open up those engagement opportunities more in the future and share that information. Obviously, it's, some, it's challenging somewhat um, to get industry into where the real-time data is, some of the key stuff that we're looking at and kind of shaping the future. But I think we still can provide opportunities like we did last week or earlier this week, and we'll have to figure out other opportunities to engage with industry and say, here's the direction and here's things going. Um, the other thing I will tell you is as industry comes about, industry days come about and stuff like that, feel free to ask questions on those. A lot of those that we host, um, we can take it to a classified session if need be, and you can ask those difficult, hard questions of where you think the threat's going in order to provide a better capability for us as we go forward. Sir, with the uh, expense of these systems being an obvious concern, is there, has there been any consideration to offloading some of the capability to UAS uh, that could provide a kind of a protective bubble to multiple manned platforms operating underneath it, if that makes sense? So yes, yeah, absolutely. So that's a, that's a great question. I would say that for the last few years, we've been so worried about the Juons type threats in the man pads that we've been focusing on that capability. Uh, as we go forward though, we need to start incorporating that, that capability on the um, UAS and projecting that capability out forward and figuring out the best way to combine technologies, combine resources on the battlefield to be effective. At the end of the day though, I would still say that there needs to be a self-protect 
uh, capability on the platform. Now, can we use UAS as it goes forward as the technology miniaturizes and allows it to be put on those platforms? Yes, that's a great area, and that's kind of one of those areas we're looking into the future. Sir. Sir, a question. What are we doing to reach out to commercial available technologies that may not be a part of the defense industrial complex? That's a difficult question. Um, what's that? Rapid innovation funds. Yes, like General Volmec said, there's rapid innovation funds. We're using them in numerous areas. The other thing I will tell you is um, we kind of put a lot of that emphasis on the primes to go out there and explore the battlefield and figure out where other technologies available that uh, it doesn't necessarily need to rely on um, the traditional partnerships. And then the other piece is Ralph Terizio and his team. We're trying to challenge them to go out there and find the commerciality aspect. I will tell you one area that we're kind of doing that is the uh, uh, laser technology, where Daylight's using commercial lasers to do, be effective in some of our solutions. And I'll turn it over to the boss. No, I was just going to, if I can add, so we are going down, especially on FPAs, detector assemblies, next generation leaps, FPGA boards, and all that. So we're bringing that to bear, and we're using, again, what's called, it's, a, it's a, an OSD initiative called Rapid Innovation Funds. But that's where we're reaching out and bringing that into industry. And for industry, again, if you're on in a detector area, it is all about SLS and leveraging the commercial SLS and the foundries um, and the supply chain paths there. And we're also, we've got to make it, so it's about deep wells, it's about digital ROACs, it's about the pixels. So all of that that we've talked, actually all the presentations is about the pixels and to get to that, Again, we're driving the underlying technologies that are our commercial base, or resident in the commercial. And again, it's about how do you then bring those in um, bleeding edge wise into form factors and into solutions. But I believe we're doing that in concert. And again, I highlighted the OTA activities, MFU Air. MFU Air is all about EA. And this gets back to the the offboarding, the opportunities, the bubble, the protections, what can we do? But again, we're trying to understand the, um, the battle space. And, and then what are the constraints and limitations of JAM? So is it precision-based? Is it broad-based? Because again, now you start getting to swap seas and other considerations in power. Um, but again, it's not just group uh, four, but we're going all the way down to group two. Even as Kevin highlighted on RF counter, there is a huge opportunity. And again, I, I foot stomped early about EW uh, enhancements, and, and there are huge opportunities. But I hope in part answered your question. I believe with our OTAs, the consortium C5, all our efforts, uh, as well as RIF and other sources, we're bringing that to bear. So with commercial industry, what we're seeing the advance, especially in, in terms of those things that are foundational in, in detector-based capabilities that are anchors. Thank you. If I could just uh, tap on that point too. Ralph Teresio, the name's been said a few times. So at CERDIC I2WD, we do let out RFIs every so often. I'm not really sure if there's one out at the moment because I've been away on an assignment. But if you think that your, uh, your commercial technology would help us solve the problem, please do, don't hesitate to send it in, all right? On Fed, Fed Biz Ops, okay? Because we're always looking for what's that technology we don't, that we just don't know about, right? Okay, thanks. Hey, Kevin, I would just offer, I'd just offer up to everybody the question that Steve asked about in terms of making sure that industry partners understand the threat. And so to our S&T brothers and sisters that are here too, um, for us it's CERDIC I2WD as well as JOINT and many others that we use. What we have to do is even when they're in the early phases and they have the broad agency announcements, we must always have a classified threat discussion. For those of you that attend, attended the SEMA session, 
We had multiple classified sessions. We brought in all the IC partners to give thread updates and to walk you through. We will also take it as a do out. I believe in the world of ASC, we must also have an industry day forum that's dedicated to understanding the threat. And as far as we can push the classification levels and the discussion so everybody does know what's emerging, what's worrying all the intel analysts across the agencies and activities. But I think that's how we can try and further help industry really know and be attuned to the threat. Most of the large defense companies are attuned to the threats, but we want everybody out there to really understand holistically the threats. Thanks. I think we got time for one last question, if anybody. I don't know who wants it. Okay, I will walk it over there as I'm walking this way to get to the stage. <laughs> he got lucky because I was going to ask you about cybersecurity, so the next panel better get ready. Uh, yes, uh, General Volmec uh, referred to uh, multifunction EW that's uh, being uh, managed by one of your sister, uh, mm -hmm. sister uh, program offices. Uh, can you comment at all on how there might be some synergy or how you might leverage that activity that's going on in, up in Aberdeen that might uh, help uh, Army yeah. Aviation. Uh, do you want that one, sir? <laughs> I'm, I will tell you, being new in the job, less than 50 or 55 or so days, that's one of the areas that I need to dive so into. So Colonel that. Kevin so Finch is that. the project manager for electronic warfare. And I, again, in cyber-wise, I don't care about the defense. I only care about the offense. But they're tightly coupled, and again, they are nesting it with Kevin's, as well as getting to future vertical lift, as well as to the aviation schoolhouse that they understand. Again, Ryan, and, as well as Tapo, Scott, we're lockstep in terms of understanding where are we going EA-wise with MPU, MUMTI, many other activities. There is huge opportunities with a lot of the capabilities that are EWEA-based that we can also help close the gap that Kevin talked about on aviation platforms in this very contested RF uh, challenged environment, especially against near peers. And, and I am making sure that the communities are talking. There are a lot of activities out there. We're early in the MFU air in terms of EA capabilities. We have four parallel lines of effort. They're all there just to prove out. We're just not sure yet which way. But we're also, again, engaging everybody here, as well as PEO Aviation, as well as the future vertical lift to make sure on the RF counters, we're not missing the opportunities. There are opportunities to bring capabilities to bear. And I go back to what I opened up with. Something may be viewed as passive, it actually can be active, and it should, vice versa. And I think there's huge opportunities when it comes to the RF. Hey, Kevin, thank you very, very much, uh, not just for your support, but for a great pitch. Uh, like the interaction with the audience, we're, we're starting to wake up. I think some people missed their first cup of coffee.